Okay, quick overview of the history. So in the late 1800s, um, a, a guy from Felsted. I think the story begins way back in 1885 when an old Falstedian, Reverend White, was placed at St Luke's in Canning Town and one day whilst walking across the marshland he met a group of boys. There was a real need here um, and wanted to share the gospel in the area and they had a magic lantern and used to tell story, Bible stories to kids. Um, using this, this lantern, using these pictures. But he then wrote to uh, Felsted, and Felsted very kindly uh, sponsored the building of a tin hut that became something of a mission centre, uh, a youth uh, activity centre in the marshland of Newham. Um, and that was really the very first mission to this area was, was from Felsted, and they shared the gospel with local people living here, um, right in the height of, of the docks. The custom house and the docks, the, the two things are, are so interwoven, the history is just so connected. And even the name custom house comes from customs. That's, that's kind of the name of the area is, is created because of those docks. If you were um, born in the local area, chances are you would work in the docks in some way or one of the factories around the docks over the years that uh, Mission Hall grew and grew and became ever more popular. Uh, I understand that there were swimming lessons uh, for people uh, uh, working on the docks, uh, football clubs and all kinds of activity for the community. And eventually that mission building led to the creation of the Ascension Church. Um, this grand building in a very flat area um, and really stood out in the community, was a really significant part of the local community and, and was bustling and so busy and so many people came to this church. And then uh, at the turn of the century, uh, Felstedians uh, had a collection that uh, contributed to, towards the building of the Ascension Church as we know it today. We're delighted to have been able to link up with the Royal Docks School and offer a bursary for a pupil to come to Felsted each year and be part of our sixth form. This is a great way for our communities to link together This is how I say it to people. The cafe was set up in 1994 um, by the most wonderful couple. They were hippies and they never left the 60s, I swear. <laughs> So we'd heard lots of stories, uh, even before we came, about Bill and Eve. And uh, so they're, uh, they're, you know, they're famous, absolutely famous, within Custom House. Right, we were a greengrocer business shop, right, in, in, the, in the east end of London. The same place. Which we opened up in 1978. Um, we had no supermarkets and it was the old East End community that liked fresh veg and fruit and cabbages and potatoes, basic stuff. So we had a roaring business there and it, it was very successful. Uh, but then the docks shut down and the old East End people either died off or moved away and we had a new community, a new community oh, built, built around us. There was yuppies coming in, buying up property, there was asylum seekers. It became a very mixed community. But it was broken, it wasn't a community. There was a lot of friction, a lot of brokenness, a lot of darkness, and I was part of that. I was wrecked, I was doing sex, drugs and rock and roll big time. There was a guy who used to come in the shop, Benny Stafford, he's still around, <laughs> and he used to say to me about Jesus, and yeah, of course I know Jesus, Ben, I know Buddha, I know Krishna, I know it all. C.S. Lewis said, it's only when you're in the gutter that you look to God. And then all of a sudden, my world fell apart. My family broke up, my family life broke up. And my kingdom collapsed and my family collapsed. My mental health and my physical health collapsed because of the lifestyle I was living. So I was in a very bad place. So I went round to Benny and I said, look, this Jesus geezer, if he's real, I'll have some of it. <laughs> so we prayed and that was it. It turned, turned Jesus did come into my life and it, and it turned everything around. So we, we carried on with the greengrocer shop. We were just about making a living, just about paying the rent. 
Um, but all of a sudden, people, instead of seeing me drunk in the street or picking me up out of the gutter, they've seen a new person. So I was a witness just in myself. And people were coming in and saying, would we pray for them and stuff like that? And then all of a sudden, and we found, we're having prayer meetings out the back of the green on road, the sitting on the sacks of potatoes. We're having, and there's people praying in tongues. And it, it was just amazing. This whole ministry built up in the potato shop. So we thought, well, why not turn it into a God shop? Which is what it became known Everybody as locally. That, they yeah. got a God shop. God shop. And, uh, and they decided to take the space they had, they, they had something, they had a resource and that was a shop front and they uh, were given the idea to stop selling potatoes and to start selling God. And so they had this idea to turn it into a cafe and they got some tables and chairs from a skip, they got a kettle and a gas camping stove and they just did it and they just started um, with the full support of the church, we were really behind them. And this idea that this space would be a space where people could go to if they didn't know where to go to get help and support um, and a place to be, a safe place to be. Bill felt, felt, and Eve felt, felt very strongly that um, God doesn't want them to be a greengrocer. That what this community needs, a community that's actually still in transition, that's still recovering, is, is a place to come and place to, to be. And so the coffee shop uh, which it was then, and it was basically a coffee shop from borrowed furniture, uh, a, a gas, uh, a camping gas stove, and the vicar's wife making cakes. And that was the beginning of, of the garden calf. And if you can picture someone like, you know, just a bald-headed East End boy, who's a bit mad, but who is unusual in that he wears all kinds of colourful stuff, with a top hat, plays guitar, tries to sing, and just loves people with an expansive heart, then that's, that's Bill. He will, he will embrace you. And Eve is just like that too, only Eve's a bit more sensible, I think, than Bill. <laughs> but the two key words about the garden calf was belonging. It, people felt they belonged in the garden calf. And spirituality, it had that spiritual um, ethos about it. It wasn't just a calf, it wasn't just tea and bacon sandwiches. It had a spiritual ethos and people were hungry for that. Bill and Eve are, are remarkable people, absolutely unique. All of the breadth of humanity and community was found in that place. There was people of all walks of life people who were very, very different to me. And everybody was accepted in that place. It was more than a calf. Like the calf was just such a loving environment. You knew you were safe in them, regardless of how bad your day was, you'd go and you'd be like, it'd be okay. They were the most natural and effective community workers that I'd ever come across, you know. The, the hospitality was sort of the initial meeting point for so many conversations of all kinds, for support of all kinds. Um, just the most incredible place. And that was really Bill and Eve's baby. And I don't think that place could have existed or formed in the way it has if it wasn't for them. Jonathan was a curate in Buckhurst Hill. We went to see Bishop Roger Sainsbury. He said, it's time to talk about what happens after your curacy. And Bishop Roger says, I have been praying about this and I have two parishes that I think you would be a great fit for either one. The first one is in Walthamstow. It has a very large vicarage, a great back garden. It's right next to a YMCA. I think you'd be good with the young people there. So I'm thinking about that. The second one is a Church of Ascension Victoria Docks in Custom House. John Jonathan almost leapt off his <laughs> chair. He said, that is my dream parish. Ascension really was my dream parish. When I, even before I went to theological college, uh, I met with Robert Howarth to uh, interview him about uh, inner city uh, church work. And uh, I'd read the Faith in the City report, got very excited by that. Margaret Thatcher wasn't excited by that. So that made me even more excited about that. So I came down uh, and did an interview with Robert 
and uh, just fell in love with the place in as much as I could then. And through college, I kind of dreamt about it being my parish of, of, of choice, but um, it didn't come up. But it did come up after I was a curate and I became the vicar. It was fantastic. Jonathan and Shara are two kind of key key influences in my early early years and they were two key fundamental people who had strong kind of foundation um, within who they were in God and who they were um, within my kind of church community. At the time the area had the largest concentration of under 10 year olds in the nation with the lowest level of provision. And also at the time, um, the church was meeting at four o'clock in the afternoon. And that's because when the church had to close to be refurbished, they had to find another place to meet. And Custom House Baptist said, hey, you can use our space, but at four o'clock in the afternoon. So they kept that time at four o'clock as we moved to Ascension. And Jonathan looked around the community and said, hey, why don't you do something, Shara, with cheerleading? before the service on Sunday at four o'clock and then try to get the kids to stay for church. <laughs> so <laughs> we gave that a try. Yeah. They were so passionate about supporting young people who may not have necessarily had the best start in life or may not necessarily have the best home environments. And so they would act as that foundation for, for certainly myself and for my peers at the time. So on the 4th of July in 1996 at Newham Leisure Center, we had different churches playing each other in a five-a-side tournament and we provided cheerleaders for that. And the churches at the time weren't quite ready to do the five-a-side thing, but the young people were like, hey, we wanna keep doing this cheerleading. And it was July and I'm like, well, you know, we've done it for a couple of months. If you're still interested in September, let me know. And September came, they came and knocked on the vicarage door and were like, hey, it's September, it's time. What I do specifically remember is moments and learning specific scriptures or learning about God and trust and faith and hope through cheerleading. So as part of the children's church, we would do we would do different stunts or we would do different activities based around cheerleading and that's how Shara would communicate the Bible to us at that time. Ascension Eagles grew to um, to serve about a thousand kids a month, um, which was pretty amazing. They got a lot of the schools in Newham to work together, um, sent coaches into the schools to help them learn. Um, and we got to do some pretty amazing things. We got to perform at the Lambeth Conference for uh, bishops all over the world as an example of youth outreach and community. Um, got to take the kids to some amazing um, church camps to grow. We had some really funny things happen uh, during services. And I remember one time uh, I was uh, doing a series on the Ten Commandments. And I was preaching on stealing. And uh, these kids came uh, running into the parking uh, space in the car park. And uh, they uh, tried to take one of the cars. And the guys in the worship band saw it. And I saw it. And we ran down the aisle. We ran out of the church. And I chased some of these kids. And I was right behind one of them. was getting closer and closer. Turned around the corner. And there were four kids in a car waiting. And I thought, oh, no, this is it. And they, they, went to, they sort of went, Oh no, it's the pine liquor! And uh, they drove off really, really quick. But we got everything back, I think. They, they were really nice and brought it back. And what I remember about the kids around there, you know, they were up to stuff and whatever, but they had good hearts and their parents had good hearts. And uh, that's sort of the wonderful thing I remember out of Ascension was, 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 you know, being in a pretty tough place, but uh, the love of the people was, was really deep. Garden Cafe and Bill and Eve, putting people back on their feet and um, having Bible studies, women's Bible studies on a Monday night that uh, turned out to sort of uh, be Bible studies that were about getting your know, mums and their kids um, off drugs and that sort of thing were, were immense. Our motivation uh, was our faith, it was Jesus and uh, we we're doing lots of good things. Uh, but there was a time back then I thought was well, actually how can we move this forward? And then uh, a guy called Tony Kant came along who was uh, employed as a youth worker, predominantly. I came over here to the UK in January of 99 for a reconnaissance trip and did a whole lot of networking and stuff for a couple of weeks around, um, around uh, London. One of the guys that I met was a fellow called Johnny Baker and Johnny was running Youth for Christ at the time and uh, had a good yarn with Johnny and then um, 
and ended up going back to Australia because time was up. And then I had uh, an email from Johnny Baker saying, do you know, he said there's a, there's a job going in, um, in London's East End at a church there that's got a ministry with cheerleaders and stuff. And, and he said, I think you might fit in well with that. And here's the contact details of the vicar and I think you should contact him. So I did. I think God's got an immense plan for us all. And we're all part of that plan. And if you look at Ascension and the way that people's lives interweaved, like Tony Kant coming from Australia, I interviewed him on the phone. So all his PCC was crowded into his little study around his phone. And I was on the phone in Australia and they interviewed me and we seemed to get on all right. And uh, next thing you know, they offered me the job. We got him uh, to come over. What a huge leap to do that. And uh, he came with his family. We got them into schools. It was amazing. So we arrived in August of 99 to start work at Ascension as a youth worker. The first youth worker, paid youth worker actually. And that was the connection between Felstead and, and Ascension because, uh, you know, Felstead had done a lot of fundraising to get a, uh, a reasonable pot of money to be able to employ someone. Ascension was transformed in a different way. We were able to get the Ascension uh, Trust going, which was really, really important and a lot of hard work. And uh, what a ministry uh, Tony brought in as well. Excellent. Yeah, mm. absolutely. When Tony Kant came, he saw a lot of potential and it was much more than just doing youth work. He really saw all these different projects that were happening and, and wanted to create sustainability around those projects. And part of that we can talk about is, is funding and, and it being much easier for a, a charity to get the funding, but I think there's a, a lot more to it than that. I think charities create a real sense of accountability, but also a clear purpose. And, and the structures that are in place around charities where you have trustees overseeing it just gives it a, such a clear, this is why we're here, this is what we're doing. We've got a whole lot of good stuff going on here and it's showing potential to grow more and more. So we needed to get some structure around it and put it in a, put it in a, um, a way that you know, people could understand. From a theological perspective in, and a missiological perspective, it was about us trying to speak in a language that they could understand, just as God speaks to us in a language that we understand and did that through Jesus ultimately. A lot of the projects had been going for years anyway and we had been going for about five years. But without Tony Kent coming on the firm, we wouldn't have lasted much mm. longer than that five years. He saved our lives because he put in all kinds of contracts with the church and structures and he got us funding. We didn't know, even know what funding was. We didn't know you could get money for nothing. <laughs> you know, you work for what you get and, and that's what we were doing. But he <coughs> said, no, no, he said, You're, you can get funding. So he got us funding, he drew up contracts with ACT and Ascension Church and put us on the map. He really saved our bacon. The Garden Calf wouldn't have continued without him, bless him. Mm. I described Tony as being a blunt Aussie who told things as it was. And I, I would admit now to being slightly terrified of um, Tony at the time. He firstly named all the gap year students the mongrels because he said he couldn't, he couldn't afford um, thoroughbred um, youth workers. So he had to get the cheap version, the mongrels as he called us. We've had so many inspirational young people that continue to inspire me that we met during that time. Mm. And the football did eventually take yeah, off. Yeah, yes, it did. And I think uh, a number went to uh, uh, professional academies, which was pretty cool. So um, that was Lewis who did that. He was a great, great guy. I was at a um, sort of a Christian festival and there was a, a stand there for a charity called Oasis Trust. And they were sort of trying to sign people up for gap years chatting with the, um, the guys on the stand at Oasis and just, just there was something about that which just felt like, actually I want to do something a bit different at least for a year and see where that leads. And the Oasis FaithWorks provided yeah. um, youth workers to us as a training mm -hmm. post mm -hmm. and so that was wonderful um, you know we had a lot of fabulous young people through the years. So we could have ended up anywhere but um, I ended up getting placed at 
Ascension with my um, teammate uh, Amy, and we were the we were the first then of a succession of a number of different um, sort of gap year students who worked um, worked in Custom House. Different people came through, and that was really fun mm. because they could help us meet people where they were. Mm. Um, because we were young at the time, but not as young <laughs> as they were. And so that was great. In 2008, I came here as a gap year student. Um, I was placed in Ascension Church and I was placed in the home of a wonderful uh, couple, Steve and Sheila Chandler, who, who welcomed me as a, a member of their family. And in that year, I was involved in the work here at the church, in some youth work here, um, and also in the work of the cafe. And I fell in love with it and I couldn't leave. I was remembering the first day that Hannah came and we were in the church and she sat on one side and we were sitting on the other and I went over and I said, hey, come and sit with us. <laughs> and she was so shy, she was <laughs> all scared and frightened, but you know, that soon changed. <laughs> One of my favourite projects I ever set up was our summer scheme. And I, I think I did a lot of crazy things at the start because I decided that it would be a great idea to close, when the cafe was closed in the summer, to just take over the cafe and run a summer scheme in a cafe with like a whole bunch of kids. I think there was about 15 kids at that very first one. We did crafts and games and all sorts of things. It was so much fun. I think we went to the park and played games in the park as well. And we took them all on a trip to central London, which was also mad. I think Sharon and I realized earlier on that uh, we needed to work with the youth because um, that was where everything was happening and the kids were open-minded, they had uh, fresh minds and we could uh, work with them and tell them more about Jesus and uh, share the gospel with them, which was really important. And uh, then the knock-on effect was that their parents got involved and were there and I'd talk to them and Cheryl would do the cheerleading and between the two of us and all the folk at Ascension who, who were amazing, I have to say. Uh, we, we got people to come to church and it was an exciting time, really saw God do some great things, yeah. And it grew every year, just a few more kids, a few more kids, um, and we got up to 25 kids, I think, in the cafe. And at that point we said, we can't run this in the cafe. So we ran it for about four years in the cafe, so we can't run it in the cafe anymore, it's just too chaotic, we need more space. And so we moved to the church. I was looking through the list of some of the stuff that we used to do, like, that we work with the police, we work with a thing called the Diamond Project, and we had the police in the CAF once a week, talking to kids that had been in trouble with the law and probation and stuff like that. There was the multi-faith dialogue groups that we had on Saturdays, all day Saturdays, and we'd have people from all the different faith traditions all sitting down together, praying together, having a meal together. Mm. That was so successful, that one. Bill used to do classes music guitar classes and a lot of the kids from the school came in and had classes with him some other incredible young people have like petra johnson now called faith johnson she uh, came to faith during her time with ascension eagles she now runs a great charity called carmel rock in newham which helps young people get engaged in the fashion industry so the person that i am today is i run a fashion charity called carmel rock i never forget i was sitting upstairs in the gregory what was called the gregory room at ascension church um, and had this great idea that I was sharing with Shara Bryce. So we cried, she cried, we cried in the church. She was so proud to see me grow from a small child to a young adult. Shara helped me create this business plan, um, project idea to pitch for some funding, all, all of this um, at Ascension. So from 2008 to 2010, Caramel Rock um, went under the umbrella of Ascension Trust and in 2010 um, Caramel Rock was formerly its own registered charity. I was asked to look at uh, Ascension Church as my, as my next post uh, within the church and initially having looked on the website and looked at the area I said no. I was asked to look at another church in Rochford, in Essex, um, voted the eighth nicest village uh, to live in. But then my wife said to me, she said, Dave, I think, I think we need to come and have a look here. So I planned to 
uh, visit Ascension in the morning and uh, visit Rochford in the afternoon. And we didn't make it to Rochford. Dave has that quiet, um, thoughtful, caring way in which he embraces us as a community in its totality. Very early on when we walked around, we found that this was an area that felt neglected. It was a community had a long history of being done to. And it was a community that was recovering. You know, back in the mid 80s when, when the docks closed, uh, this is a community that was, that was broken up, that was disbanded. Uh, and with the, with the docks closing, a lot of the dock families moved away uh, through lack of work. Uh, and so we came at a point of, of great hope uh, because the Olympics was coming, um, but actually here in Custom House, um, that wasn't felt. You know, other areas of Newham, maybe Stratford and Forest Gate, uh, and even Canning Town to a certain extent, felt that there was, a, there was some hope for the future, there was a legacy being built. Um, not so uh, in Custom House. Uh, there was still a sense that actually we are going to miss out uh, on this, as we always have done. And there was a sense of lots of development happening around Custom House, but Custom House was in the middle of all of these things going on and the develop development wasn't actually necessarily happening in that place at that time. And I think somewhere ingrained within the community, there was a sense of feeling like people were being left out or left behind because things were happening around, but not necessarily within that community. So there was a, dare I say, a theme of, of, uh, of neglect uh, and actually nothing, nothing good uh, you know, comes you know, to Custom House. And, and if nothing good comes to it, then there is a sense of nothing good will come from it. In the Bible, again, and certainly in the Old Testament, there is this uh, belief that you, know, you look after the most vulnerable in society, you look after the most needy. And of course, Jesus says, love your neighbour as yourself. And, and someone says, well, who is my neighbour? I said, well, anyone in need and, and so basically you you just you just respond uh, to those to those in need if you go back from um, when I was a child and I was at Calvin school and I used to run past this building probably about three four times a day during the week dropping my two sisters off at St Joachim's then I used to go up to Bill and Eve when they before there was a, the garden cafe when there was fruit and veg shop and when the gooseberry season was in, my, my dinner money was spent on getting gooseberries instead of eating the dinner. <laughs> and then running back past the church and going to school and then running back to pick up my sisters and then running back. So, you know, this, this church has kind of always been around and the community. And before all of the school and everything else was built, this was so accessible. So it was, it was a massive part, you know, kids used to play outside the front, we used to swing off the, the railings out the front. My desire is actually is to, is to, sit to, to feel that people are valued. You know, we are all made in the image of God. Uh, unfortunately, we, we've tarnished that image with some of our behaviour and the way the world has become. But we hold on to the idea that every person we see uh, is made in his image. If I look back at the number of people who would have totally benefited, not because they came to church here, you know, you didn't have to come to church here to go to the lunch club or, or come to the after school club or anything like that. And that to me was really important. We are there for everyone, um, but particularly those who, who, who either not feel they fit anywhere else or have been let down. Uh, those are the most vulnerable. Uh, and we also want to get past that because you know, we, we don't want to hold on to this narrative that, that Custom House is a place where nothing good comes from Custom House. You know, you know, we, that, that cannot be the narrative going forward. We want to change the narrative. Uh, and it's slowly getting there. It's slowly getting there. Um, and, but, but for now, we, we, just, we just respond to the, sometimes the acute need that people have. Um, but we want to change aspirations. We want people to say, actually, no, no, I am valued. Uh, I am, you know, I am worth uh, something and, um, and why not? And Beryl, who was here, 
uh, was an institution. I mean, uh, the, there, I look now when I come in and I see the office and there are clear desks, I'm thinking, my goodness, Beryl would have a fit. Because in actual fact, when you came in, you couldn't see Beryl because she would be hidden under piles and piles and piles of paper. I miss Beryl greatly. And Beryl was the first person I saw when I came to Ascension. She was at Ascension, she was there. Uh, and she showed us around and, and you could tell that not only did she have love, the love of God in her heart, but the love of people as well. And she spent more hours in the church than she did at home. It's so hard to describe Beryl because everyone has this preconception of Beryl being a very um, like stern and a little bit standoffish in a sense of, but she was a no, like there was no nonsense going on there at all. Like, and she'd tell you about yourself pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> which was very nice. I love that. I absolutely adored everything about that of her. You will always find Beryl in her second home, which is the church. Uh, and so Beryl uh, has been around in the community quite a while, uh, been involved with the church quite a while, and then she was asked uh, to be what's called the church centre manager. Uh, and from then on, uh, her faith is so strong and her love for people is so much that she became part of uh, what Ascension was about. She was also church warden, um, which is a key kind of role within the Church of England. And she was just very present, always here for people, didn't take any nonsense, and a real force to be reckoned with. Beryl was a rock. She was an absolute rock. We clashed a lot <laughs> because she was old school, fundamental orthodox church, and we were breaking all the barriers. We were heretics, you know? And we clashed quite a lot, but she always came to us mm. when she needed support and we went to her. Yeah. It was a good relationship, we're looking back on it. Do you know, um, behind her back, we used to call Beryl the Bezmeister. You know, she was, uh, Beryl was just uh, one of those ladies that was always there. She was always just part of it. And people say, oh yeah, 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 yeah. But she was, she, she was in everything. And she was just, solid. I could never imagine her being frightened of anyone. I think the people would be much more inclined to be frightened of her. Even the scariest person would not mess with Beryl. <laughs> I, I learned so much from her. Never, I don't think I've ever met such a hard-working person. Um, yeah, with such a good heart um, and so strong in her faith. We had some funny giggles when we used to go out and do stuff. Like, you know, and when she'd be driving. Go, do you want to put some music on? Nope. Shall I just sing to you? Nope. And, okay, very wrong. You know, I just, and then she'd, she'd go, <laughs> and, and then she'd stop herself, you know. She was one of those people that just helped everybody. And then we went through a really interesting time at Ascension Community Trust where we ran out of funding for any sort of fundraiser or programme director. Um, and so between myself, Beryl and Dave Chesney, we kind of did the funding applications that needed to be done to keep the charity going. We got the funding from Tudor Trust. Um, I asked them for two years funding and they said have three years funding and have a bit extra on top of what you've asked for, which gosh, I swear that's unheard of. Um, yeah, that was amazing. Um, and yeah, I had this amazing opportunity to step in as CEO of the charity. She had so much guts, so much courage to take on the Garden Calf in the East End of London in Custom House, which was so alien to her background, if you like. Toaster. Toaster. <laughs> it took me a long time to learn to say that. But the courage, her courage was amazing. It was her courage again that took the cap on further. Do you know what? Hannah is more than a friend to me. She is like a sister to me. Like I know if I'm having a bad day, I know I can say to her, actually I'm having a bit like, do you mind listening to? And if she's got the time and space, she will fully say, yeah, sure. Come around, let me make you a cup of tea. Let me, let, let's just hang out. 
We, we did a vision day in the January following me stepping in and we got our staff and our trustees in together to say, okay, what should we be doing in our community? And we came up with this great tagline on that day, enabling the whole community to make the community whole. And, and there's so much packed into that one sentence, enabling, it's, it's not about serving people, it's not about just giving to people, but it's about helping people to help themselves. The whole community, we're not talking about working with just one group. Often when people talk about Christian organisations, they say, do you just work with Christians? And no, we're about working across our whole community. I love Hannah, she's so great. She's, she's always been there for me. Like through my ups and downs, she's been there and I think, I hope I've been there for her too. As soon as lockdown happened, food bank happened. Me and my son volunteered for Park Run and we met Hannah that way and then she sent us a WhatsApp and saying, does anyone want to volunteer for the food bank once the pan pandemic started? So that's what we did. <laughs> when food bank started, Hannah asked if I wanted to join and I said, yeah. Well, it's because of the pandemic mostly that you know we didn't think that anyone should be going hungry because there was nothing in the shops and such like and yeah just this day and age people shouldn't be hungry it means a hell of a lot to them they they a lot of them are very very grateful a lot of them say they wouldn't be able to manage if we weren't there they don't know what they would be able to do without it there's never a dull moment <laughs> we're always giggling there's always something funny to laugh at and we just enjoy what we do and they love whatever they're doing. We have a lot of fascinating, amazing volunteers that are working at Food Bank, which is how they know they want to be in part of the Ascension, which is exactly they show how much they want to be part of it and how much they're passionate about whatever they're doing. The amount of people that we see that are in need of help, there's just so many people that are short of money, um, having a whole multitude of varying problems that they just need that little bit of something just to keep them going, help them out and just give a little bit of reassurance that there are people in the area that do care still. I think it's a brilliant place, it's a brilliant setup, and I didn't realise that there were so many other things going on and to know that families are supported and people can get help here yeah, it's amazing. So we're part of the Ascension Church and what we try and do is give the kids some like basic skills. Um, we work on teamwork, attitude and skill um, and then life skills as well, just developing them with their confidence, like how to work as a team. You see the development from when some of them may have come from when they were three or four um, and that the development as they've gone on, like to when they're maybe five, six, seven, and they join a team, and then the dad's still in contact or the mum's still in contact, and they come to the summer camps and they're saying, "Oh, the development of what they've done." It's just, it's just really great to see. And like the number of years that we've been doing it, we've seen like players that I think some of them are actually in secondary school now, taller than me, and they come back, and it's just fantastic to see. They've got good attitudes, and they, they're just willing to learn, and that's that's what you really want to see that. Um, boys and girls like just coming back and just appreciating what we've done. I think for the trust itself the work that it does in the community is just unbelievable. Um, elders so beginning of lockdown obviously um, all of our services that was providing for them just abruptly ended. It took a, a massive toll on some of their health, their well-being, their it, mental health, everything. Me and Hannah was like, what do we do? What can we do? What are we physically able to do with, with all the restrictions and everything? But yeah, now we've been we've been doing Zoom meetings. We've been doing chair-based exercise and Pilates with Gabby, the tutor that we have. Yeah, so it's it's been nice. As I say, we've been having phone calls and and hours of conversation with them, just making sure that they're keeping safe. They've got everything that they need. Um, any other support that we can give them because I think at the beginning of lockdown we was we was actually able to provide hot meals and deliver those. It seems to be going pretty well, all considering. 
does this community care whether this church exists or not? So that if the Ascension Church burned down tomorrow and was never replaced, would that matter to that community? And it would have mattered in Custom House. And I was proud of that. I was proud to be part of a community of faith there that was doing stuff that meant real stuff to the community, that changed lives, that gave hope, that enlarged people's lives with the gospel being lived out among them. I mean, Jesus was amazing, okay, because he started where people were. He started where people were. He didn't start where he wanted them to be. He started with the clay at the beginning. And I think at Ascension, I think we did that too. I think if we give uh, people the opportunity to meet the real Jesus, I think then uh, lives are changed. And that's that's what I like to, to think. Of. People, everybody did that at Ascension. We didn't judge. We just took people as they were, started uh, where they were, and then God did the rest. And it was incredible. Thank you.